I was hoping, I was hoping that we would get through Acts one today, um, but that's not going to happen. We're not. We may not get through Acts one eighteen today. But we're on, well, we're not. We're, we're gonna. We're gonna spend most. We're gonna spend the whole time on this one verse, um, and deal with it. And uh, we're t so let's let's prepare to play to pray, not play. Let's pray. Um, and we're going to go before the Lord and ask him to help us. We've got, um, we've got quite a few folks that are starting to download uh, our Acts lessons. So I want to welcome them. Um, I guess it's podcast land. Is that, is that in the land? Um, but, uh, but we want to welcome them. So let's pray and let's ask the Lord to be with us um, during our class. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy and your grace. Thank you for your word for your powerful presence. God, I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that your anointing would fall in this room. Help us, God, as we look into your word, that you would open our understanding that we can see, Lord, what is in your word for our lives. Lord, we praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're, we're going to talk. We're going to talk about one of the most difficult passages of the scripture. Um, we're in Acts 1 and... Uh, I'm going to read verse 17, but we're really going to start studying verse 18. As a matter of fact, let's just go ahead and read. Let's read um, Acts 1, and let's start at uh, 16. And uh, this is this is this is a a difficult passage for Bible commentators, and I think by the time we get through with verse 18. Um, you're going to understand why. So this is this is the speech of the apostle Peter. Let's go back to 15. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said the number of the names were about 120. Uh, Men and brethren, the scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost spake by the mouth of David before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus for he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem insomuch as the field is called in the proper tongue Alcedema or Alcedema, that is to say the field of blood. So um, I don't think we're going to, we're, we're, we're not, we may or may not touch on verse 19 a little bit, but that's the context that we're dealing with. Uh, we're in the process here of replacing uh, Judas as a disciple. Um, last time we, we met, which has been a couple of weeks, you know, last week we had the, uh, we just, we had to deal with the funeral and visitation and all that. So we didn't have class. And so if you can remember back a couple of weeks, we're dealing with the replacement of Judas. The, um, we gave several reasons why they couldn't just go with 11 apostles. They, went, they felt like they needed to go to 12. And so uh, the, the main reason is that the apostle Peter said they needed to add one. So that's what, that's what they did. Um, so he, he talks about he talks about Judas, and in verse seventeen he says he obtained part of this ministry. Um, part of what is going on when he talks about that is he's setting up part of his argument against Judas. Um, what what I think you'll find in this particular passage is not only are they not only not only are they bringing in a new apostle. What one thing they're doing is they're sort of um, giving the anti-funeral for Judas. They're basically telling what he did and his punishment. Um, the reason, the reason this, is, this is a difficult passage of scripture is because if you read, and we're going to, we're gonna read Matthew, and we're gonna read this passage, we're even gonna go back into Luke and talk a little bit. And, and what we're gonna find are difficulties in, in how this, in, in the story, you're going to find discrepancies or apparent discrepancies, let's say it that way, between what Matthew said and what Luke attributed to Simon Peter. So before we get into this, um, 
just two or three points we'll, we'll probably bring out again. Number one is Luke's intention is not to write a history book. He's not writing a textbook for, for a Bible college. He's writing 30 years later his memories of the early part of the church. Now, why this is so difficult for Luke is he wasn't, he wasn't there when Judas died. Luke was not one of the original 12. Luke was a Gentile. He was a convert. Um, they think he was probably from Antioch, I think, if I remember correctly. And so he came on the scene later. So all of this stuff that he's telling, he's telling from what he was told. So he's, he's, he's sort of reporting second and third hand, at least second and third hand. So we don't know how far down the line it got. And then, and then we're going to deal with Luke is, is preacher, historian, and author. All have different purposes. As a historian, he's trying to give a record. As a preacher, he's trying to present a thesis and a, and a, a message about the church, the work of the Holy Ghost, the work of the Spirit. But as an author, he's, he's, he's operating in a way to make a story readable. And so it's, it's wearing three different hats. Now, we're, we're going to get to a point or two where I'm just going to say what I believe. Um, you can tell where I'm having some difficulty with this passage. Can you tell that? Because I think when we read the, the, the Matthew portion and the Luke portion from Acts, you're going to see where, where we have. And then I'm going to go to, um, I probably got 100 commentaries on Acts. I've got one of them that's 4,500 pages long. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read from, from four or five of them. A lot of them just don't deal with it at all. They just say what, what that verse says, and then they leave it alone. They don't even go back to Matthew. So we're going we're gonna to get into it. I think it's going to be important for us to be able to process information and look at it. And so that's what we're going to do. So let's, Luke, Luke here goes back, and it, it, it appears that he's, he's trying to catch the reader up. So in, in, when Luke is sitting down to write, it's basically 30 years later. He's writing somewhere between 80, 60, 80, 100. Some push it back as far as 80, 110. Most think it's right around 70 to 80. And so you're talking, you're talking 30, 35, 38 years later, he sits down to write. Um, and so he's, he's going back to a point 30, let's just say 35 years. Let's just round it to 35, 30, 35 years. And you'll know it could be up or down. He's writing 35 years later on something he was not a witness of. So already what's happened is the story has gotten into the, the phase of oral history. And so, for instance, the first five books of the Bible written by who? Who are they attributed to? Moses. Moses. Um, was Moses alive when Adam and Eve were in the garden? No. Was alive. He wasn't alive when Noah built the ark. He wasn't alive when, when God called Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. Um, he wasn't alive when Joseph was sold into slavery. So how did, how did Moses get those stories? His, he pointed up. So he's saying God gave them to him. But, is it, it, but how did God give it to him? That's the question. Did God give it to him in a dream? It was passed down by oral history. Cain and Abel learned the story from Adam and Eve. Seth learned it from Adam and Eve, and, and, and so their kids learned it, and so it's passed down as oral history. The Jews were so particular about their stories that they came up with this whole group called the Masoretes, and their job was to interpret, was to copy the stories. If they were writing on a page and they made a mistake and they spent, you know, it was handwriting and they, they made a mistake at the bottom of the page, tough. You start all over. You don't, you don't just blot it out and keep going. They had these, they had a, a list of, I think it was 116, but don't hold me to that, rules that they had to go by. 
to ensure that the stories were told accurately. The, the Jewish children had to memorize the first five books. That's how, how valuable they felt the word of God was. They had to memorize it. Um, the bar mitzvah, bar mitzvah was the celebration into, into adulthood from a Jewish male. And to do that, you had to be able to quote, you had to be able to quote the law. And so when we're talking about oral history, what we're talking about is something that's meticulously passed down. It's, it's not, you know, we're, it's not like, like, uh, like my dad heard a story from his dad and he told it to me. And if I get 15 facts out of the story wrong, it's no big deal. Cause it's just a story. They didn't look at it this way. So when we talk about oral history, we're talking about a meticulously protected oral history. Now, so he said that God gave the, st the, the stories to Moses. And I agree with that, but it's my belief. God gave him the stories through oral history passed down because if God gives it only to Moses and then Moses tells the story of Adam and Eve and he makes up half of it, who cares? But if everybody's been passed down the same tradition and Moses doesn't get it right, well, they know it and they are meticulously committed to the integrity of the story. And so God did get, in my opinion, God did give it to Moses that way, but God gave it to, God gave it to Moses, but he gave it through oral history. And so instead of one witness, you have thousands of witnesses and it protects the integrity of the, of the report. You understand what I'm saying? And so now when you look at the New Testament, now what you have is, is you have a church that's 30 some years after the resurrection, after Pentecost. And so you have Luke presenting a, a story that he heard from somebody, apparently. So let's just get into it. Let's just look at it. So Luke's trying to catch the reader up. Um, he wasn't there when it happened, so he had to be told the story. So he, he goes into this. Now, there's, there's two theories. Let's go to Luke 22, 47 and 48. We're going to go back to, to uh, when the actual betrayal happened. And, and, and honestly, while you're, while you're looking for that, um, I don't know how I can say this and it not sound disrespectful or sacrilegious. Um, but the story of Judas really isn't that important to what's happening in Acts here. Um, how, how Judas died makes no, has no bearing on how they pick the next apostle. It doesn't matter. It wouldn't have mattered if somebody shot him through the head with an arrow. It wouldn't make a difference. They were still going to pick another apostle, and how he died didn't change the fact. So, so it's curious that, they, that they, they, they put this story in there. So either Luke is doing it, either while Peter's giving his speech, Luke decides to add this, this, this section to explain why they're talking about it, or is part of Peter's actual speech, and it's hard to know which is which, okay? So, um, so Luke 22, 47 and 48, while he yet spake, behold a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the 12 went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him, the common greeting of the day, a kiss on the cheek. Um, but Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the son of man with a kiss? So this is the betrayal, this is where this is where Judas crosses, you, you're familiar with the term crosses the Rubicon. That was a river when Julius Caesar, his armies crossed the Rubicon, there was no going back. And so when you talk about going to the point of no return, crossing, they, they call it crossing the Rubicon. This was Judas's Rubicon. This is the moment up until this point, he could have, he could have backed down. But when he led them to Jesus, and gave the signal that that's who, who Jesus was. At this point, Jews' destiny is sealed. Um, Keener notes, Keener, Craig Keener notes, the literary use of digressions. So he's, what he's saying is in ancient literature, they would use these digressions. They used it in the Iliad, the Odyssey. And this particular detail, according to Keener, has nothing to do with the overall message of Acts or with the appointment of the apostle. He says, Luke uses a, a digression here, probably to inform the reader 
what has happened since the end of his gospel or at least since his last mention of Judas. He likens the use of digressions to those used by Homer in the Iliad and the Odyssey, summing it up by saying digressions were common practice among the ancient historians. So he's telling a story, they get to Judas and he feels like he has to go back and tell people what happened. Judas betrayed the Lord, he had part in our ministry and so forth. I think it's important to note that that um, as I mentioned, Luke's not trying to produce a history book. He's not trying to produce dates and times. As a matter of fact, he rarely puts dates on anything. He says what happened. He doesn't necessarily say this happened on Thursday, AD 31, 36, 38. He doesn't give dates like that. Um, so he's not making a history book. He's telling, he's giving a historical account to his, to his view. And so there's no need to assume a digression here. There's no need to assume that, that Luke is adding something. I'm, it's my opinion. He's trying to write down what he heard that Peter said in the upper room that morning. He's writing down what the story that he was told. Somebody told him what happened. They're in the upper room. They're praying. They're in that, that, that period between the ascension and Pentecost. And during this time, Simon Peter stands up. Simon Peter he, he, he begins to say, you know, we got to get another, we got to appoint another apostle. Uh, we got to get a 12th apostle. We got, and Judas, you know what he did. And, and he's just telling the story. Well, this is how Luke remembers hearing the story. Um, so I don't think that there's a digression. I believe that, that to Luke's understanding, Simon Peter actually said these words. Um, my, 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 um, not argument with Kinnear, uh, with Keener. My um, my opposite. I guess it is an argument. Um, is that he's looking for a literary device. He's treating Luke as an author only, in this particular case. That he's trying to make the story more interesting. So he goes back and talks about how how Judas's guts spill everywhere. You know, because that's dramatic. And so he's he's treating Luke basically like a like an author. Do you have a question? Oh, okay. You had your hand. I didn't know if you were. Okay. Um, to me, he's treating Luke as an author of a book, not as giving a real account. And so when I think he talks about di digressions that Luke's added in, I think it's making Luke more of a, of a um, historical fiction writer than a, than, a, than a biblical writer. And so I have, I have a, I have a, fundamental disagreement with Keener on this point. I don't think he's using a digression. I don't think he's using a literary device. I think what he's doing is saying, this is what I was told that Peter said. So if I have a comment on that, you understand where we're at? You, you may or may not understand why we're, why I'm being so, so deliberate trying to establish where we're at here because there is a difference in the story is given by Matthew and what's given by Luke and Acts. And so we're not going to ignore and act like it's not there. We're not going to pretend that, that it's not there. So what we're going to do is present views of why it's there. And then we're going to make our, we're going to try to make a, a decision or at least a discussion on what, what the consensus is. Does that sound fair? And so, we are, we are looking here, and uh, I think it's Peter's actual speech to the crowd. There's not a need for a literary device if he's merely acting as a reporter of an actual event. Um, it is most likely that Peter felt it was important to mention to the crowd um, what was going on. So it was actually Peter's digression back to tell the story than it was Luke's. So we're left to assume at first glance that rather than leaving the money on the ground, you know, so let's, let's read what he, let's read what he did. Um, it says that now this man talking about Judas, now this man purchased the field. So if you remember in Matthew's story, let's read Matthew's account. Um, Matthew 27 verse three, and I'm going to read I'm going to read Acts 18 and 19 again while you're turning there. Now this man, this is Simon Peter, apparently Simon Peter talking in the upper room to the 120. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity. 
So who bought the field according to, according to Luke? Judas. Judas, right? Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst and all of his bowels gushed out. Uh, and it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem in so much as that field is called in their proper tongue, a seldoma, that is to say the field of blood. So that is, that is Acts 1, 18 and 19. Now let's read Matthew's account. Then Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple, departed and went and hanged himself. And the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, it is not lawful for to put them in treasury because it's the price of blood. And they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field. Now, according to Matthew, who bought the potter's field? The priest. The priest, right? To bury strangers in, wherefore that field was called the field of blood unto this day. Then was fulfilled that prophecy which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, and they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord appointed me. So, you see the you see the you see the the issue, right? You see the issue in in Acts. Judas bought the field. Um, he fell headlong. He burst asunder. His bowels gushed out. He bought the field with the reward of iniquity. Matthew says the priest bought it. So the, this is this is the this is the issue we're left to deal with. Who's telling the truth? Is it possible both are telling the truth? I think it is, yeah. Because the implication is that he purchased it with the act that he committed. Right. There That's you what go. I would like. Ah, you guys are you guys are a step ahead. So it's possible that we know according according to Matthew, what we know is the priests are the ones that actually made the transaction. Mm -hmm. And so, but but regardless, Peter attributes it to Judas's act. So let, let's, let's look at it and then we're gonna look in here and we're gonna just have some uh, discussion on it. Longnicker, I don't remember, Richard Longnicker. He wrote, the problem chiefly concerns how Judas died. This is talk, he's talking about the discrepancy between Acts and Matthew. But it also involves such, such questions as who bought the field and why is it called the field of blood? The latter matters are perhaps not too difficult. Probably the common explanation suffices. The chief priest bought the potter's field in Judas's name with the 30 silver coins belonging to him and the local Jerusalemites, particularly the Christians, nicknamed it the field of blood because they felt it had been purchased with blood money. So anybody got a, a, a take or a comment on this, on this point of view? You understand what they're saying? They're saying the priest bought it they, they can't put it back in the treasury. They can't put that because it's blood money. They can't put the blood money back in the church treasury. And so they got to do something with it. It's not lawful to take blood money. If it was lawful to take blood money, then they could hire, then people could hire priests to kill people for a donation to the church. And so they can't, they can't take blood money and put it in the treasury. And so what they're, so he said, we got to do something with it. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go buy this field and we're going to use it to bury to bury Jews, and that's basically what what Longnecker says. Anybody has a have a comment? Anything on this? What was his name? Longnecker. Richard Longnecker. Longnecker. L O N G. I think it's E N E C K E R. Okay. And let me see. I got his citation. Yeah, L O N G E. N E C K E R Richard Long Longacre. All right, so let's let's talk about Joseph Fitzmeyer. Joseph Fitzmeyer is one of my favorite commentaries on Acts. Um, he's a German. Uh, he wrote for the Anchor the the Yale Anchor Bible. Joseph Fitzmeyer he says, quote, because Matthew five says he hanged himself. Attempts have been made to harmonize the two descriptions of what Judas did to himself. That. I got robe, but it's supposed to be rope. The rope broke in, or the branch on the tree 
on which he hanged himself cracked, and so he plunged headlong and burst in two. The texts, however, were not meant to be harmonized. Now here's, here's why I added this quote from Fitzmaier. The texts, however, were not meant to be harmonized. They merely echo different legends about Judas's death. So what Long, Long or Fitzmaier says is the accounts are different, but it doesn't matter. It's not doctrinal. It's not doctrinal. This is what one guy heard. This is what one guy heard. And it doesn't really matter because it's not a matter of, of, of truth. It doesn't change theology. It doesn't change doctrine. It doesn't change, it doesn't change anything eternal. It's just, this is what one guy heard and this is what one guy heard, but, but they don't necessarily know which is which. So anybody have an idea on that, on Fitzmyers? These texts, however, were not meant to be harmonized. They merely echo different legends about Judas's death. If it's meant to be harmonized, you'd have to die that way to go to hell. <laughs> He says it was not meant to be harmonized. What he's saying is it doesn't matter that Matthew says it one way and, and, and Peter quoted it a different way because it doesn't make any difference. Neither one of them were apparently there. So it's all legend. Nobody, nobody probably witnessed it. I doubt he had a crowd watching him kill himself. And so it's all legend. And one heard this report, one heard that, and it doesn't matter. Anybody have any, uh, any thoughts or ideas on that? I always think it, it would be how you said it originally. That's how I always thought of it, that he hung himself and the rope broke or the, or the, uh, the limb cracked or something, you know, and he fell down. So, so let's, let's, let's take this one step further. But then if nobody saw it, it's all summation. It you know, all is. Yeah. We, it's uh, all summation. Unless somebody witnessed it, we don't know what happened. I mean, they've got, they go and they see, they see Judas and, Body down there is his, 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 uh, the Bible said his, his, well, his bowels gushed out. His, his, his innards are laying on the rocks. There happens to be a rope or tree, a broken limb or whatever. And, uh, and they just put two and two together. They do detective work and they figure it out, but nobody really knows. And so, but, but here's, here's the question. Does it change the inspiration of Scripture to have two different views of the same event? That's happened a lot of times. Two different views. Does it does it change the message if Brother Stan gets one thing out of my sermon and Brother Austin gets something else and Wiley gets something else? It's going to be that way. But it, does it change the inspiration of Scripture? I don't think so. so Here's, here's, what, here's what we have to understand. The Bible is written by men anointed by God, but every man has his viewpoint of history. In matters that are not important to eternity and doctrine, it it doesn't really matter how Judas died. Does it? Does it change anything? Does it make him less lost if he committed suicide than he would have been just for selling Jesus to, to die? We can all see the same event. We all have different right. views of it. And so, and so the, the re, you know why we're taking time to look at this? Because this is a fundamental issue when it comes to biblical interpretation. That, that does, you, you, is, it, is it changed the inspiration of the scripture? If Peter remembers it one way, Luke writes it one way. I mean, it's possible that in the 30 some years from the time that Peter said it until it was passed through the grapevine to Luke wrote it, that what Luke wrote wasn't exactly what Peter said, but does it change the inspiration of the scripture? If that's the case. It's actually not a quote, but it's still a version of the same story. It's not, a, it's not necessarily a quote. It's a report of what was said. Um, but, but I think this is an important question. If you're going to be a Bible student, then, then these are important questions to have. They're important discussions to have. 
you know, we can brush it under the table and say, and, and say that this issue isn't there, but I don't, I think it makes us stronger by being able to discuss it. When somebody says, well, you believe in the Bible, but Matthew and Luke, they didn't agree. So how, so then you're caught off guard. We've never talked about it. We spent 8,000 years studying the book of Acts and we never talked about it. And then when you're faced with a question from an unbeliever or an atheist about a, a discrepancy in the scripture and you don't know how to answer it, we failed you. That's why we're spending so much time discussing something that seems on the surface insignificant. Because though the issue itself might be somewhat insignificant, it doesn't make any difference on, the, on who the apostle was that was chosen. It almost is out of place here. It seems like this should have been discussed in the gospels, not in Acts. But why is it important for us to look at? It's important because you have to have your hands around the scripture and be able to look at issues and be able to, to answer the questions. Make sense? What we're trying to do is prepare you for the marketplace. You know what I mean by that? Get you ready for, for discussing this. So, um, so Fitzmaier says it's not meant to be harmonized. It's just two different legends about Judas' death. Probably nobody saw it. They just show up. There's a body down there. Don't know how long. Maybe they see buzzards circling. I don't know why they, but they found him. And so that's it. All right, here's how F.F. F. Bruce addressed this passage. He says, quote, Peter did not need to tell. I got to do better when I copy. His hearers in the upper room what had happened to Judas. Peter did not need to tell his hearers in the upper room what had happened to Judas, nor can the words of verse 19 that the field came to be called in their speech, Hakeldama, be part of Peter's direct speech. But when Luke visited Jerusalem in AD 57, he was probably told the story of Judas's death and he inserts it here. Judas, he was told, bought the field with his ill-gotten gain but he did not live to enjoy the fruits of his shameful act for he fell and sustained a fatal rupture. The field was accordingly called in the Aramaic name, meaning the field of blood. So let's unpack what Bruce, F.F. Bruce said. Did you, catch, did you catch the nuance here? Did you catch what Bruce is saying? Anybody get anything out of that before we, we go into an explanation? Did you catch anything different from Bruce? Fitzmaier says, they're not supposed to be harmonized, right? Longnicker, he says that the priest bought, bought the, the field with the blood that Judas got, and, and so it's attributed to Judas because he did the act that got the money. And so Judas' action bought the land. So now here, Bruce is, Bruce is basically saying, Luke visited Jerusalem in AD 57. He was probably told the story of Judas' death and he inserts it here. So what does this, what does this do? What's this, what's Bruce, if Bruce is right, what's he doing? We're no longer getting the report of what Peter said. We're having an interjection by Luke. And so it takes it from a quote to a literary, a literary edition by Luke to explain what Peter was talking about, all right? You guys aren't as interested in this detail stuff as I am, are you? Or are you? I don't know if you are or not. I am. So he, so, so he says that Luke inserts it here. So he's telling the story of Peter in the upper room, but he says Luke inserted this part of it. Judas, he was told, bought the field with his ill-gotten gain, but he did not live to enjoy the first fruits of a shameful act. Anybody have an idea on that? That, that Luke inserted it. Anybody care? I think I think Peter said it. I think Luke Luke heard the story uh, that Luke heard that Peter said it. Let's put it that way. Nobody has a comment. Anything on on uh, Bruce? All right, F. J. Folks Jackson. He says this, Mark tells nothing, that Mark tells nothing is an indication that the tradition of his miserable death was not part of the original story. So he says, Matthew talked about it, Luke talked about it in Acts, Mark never mentioned it, so it's probably not original. No, why would he say that? Anybody? 
Nobody. First gospel written was Mark's. The other gospels they believe were based off of the gospel of Mark. Mark wrote then Matthew and, and Luke and John. There's a lot of there's a lot of overlap. So what they're saying is Mark didn't write about it, and so it's probably not original. They just adding in stories that they heard about how he died. I, and when I say adding in, I'm not not that they made it up, but that that's what they had heard, so they reported what they heard. Anybody got any comment on that? Nobody. A thought. Nothing. Nobody has anything. Wow, you guys. Campfire stories. Yeah, yeah you know, Matthew remember, heard it this way. Luke heard it this way. Mark didn't write about it at all. Because to Mark, it apparently didn't make any difference. Um, Do you think Mark really cared about it? I, you know, I think that they... I, Part of the thing, and, and we didn't I didn't really get into this because I thought that I thought that we would get a lot more discussion out of out of this. Shows what I know. Um, but there's in ancient literature, there's this there's this theme of violent, painful death. Like like, like you know, you're that's your your this there's no way to be there's no way to be pretty about it, but that you 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 get split open, your guts hang out and it's painful, but you don't die for a while. And it's, and it's this theme that you get what you deserve. You did something terrible, you deserve to die a terrible death. And so this whole idea that, that his guts gushed out was, was in some way fitting for what he did. And so I, do I think Mark cared how he died? I think so. They'd spent three years. Um, even though he had betrayed the Lord, they knew him. So I think he... If you're asking me, do I think Mark cared if he died or how he died? I think he cared. I just don't think that Mark thought it was pertinent to his message. It didn't matter. It didn't matter to what he's going to say. Um, I got a friend in Arizona that wrote, he wrote a book. And he started out to write this book and, and it grew to like 500 pages. And um, so he called me three or four weeks ago, he wants me to read his book. And, uh, and so he's talking about his book and he's talking about these chapters he wants to add. And, uh, and so I asked him the question, I said, what is your purpose? What are you writing? And so he tells me the purpose. I said, what do these chapters add to that purpose? He said, well, nothing. I said, well, why do you want to write them? He said, because I'm interested in it. I said, okay, well, you're working on the second book. Because adding stuff that doesn't go along with the purpose takes away from the purpose. And so when you're asking me about Mark, I don't think that he felt it was important. For what he was trying to accomplish with what God had given him to write, how Judas died didn't matter. So he had a different message? Well, I think he just, he had, the, he had a message that, that Judas' death didn't make a difference to. It just didn't matter. Um, it didn't matter in perspective to his to his particular lesson. And so if if you've got let's say you've got a job. Let's say I have let's say I have these three guys and I'm going to have these three each we're going to we're going to do a lesson and I'm going to have them do we're going to do a sermon on praise and they're all going to do a part. And he's going to do about why we clap our hands and he's going to do why we raise our hands and he's going to do why we why we shout or dance. I don't know. Somehow Pentecost dancing and shouting got interchanged. The screaming became dancing. I don't know how that worked. But anyway, um, however it happens, they all have a job. But, but he finds something really interesting that he wants to talk about, but it's on his subject. So the question is, should he inject it or should he stay on the subject? Because his job is to talk about why we lift our hands and by him taking part of his 15 minutes to talk about his subject, he can't really cover his point. If he won't stay on 15 minutes, he needs to be his yeah. alone. If he wants to really treat his point, yeah. he's got to stay on point. And so when you're asking me about why Mark didn't deal with it, I just don't think Mark felt like it mattered how he died. Um, but, for, but Luke, 
But, but Luke in, in the book of Acts, or, or Simon Peter, if it's Simon Peter's quote, and Matthew felt like it mattered. I think, I think that Simon Peter, if this is a direct quote from him, I think he felt like it was important for the church to understand that when you do something bad, you pay for it. That, that when you do something that rises to the level of betraying the Christ for 30 pieces of silver, that it's not like just going out and telling a fib, that there's a, that there's a price to be paid. And I think that's why he, I think that's why he went into his bowels gushed out. You know, his, he fell down the, the, the hill and hit the rocks and his guts came open and, you know, bleh. but that's what happens when you betray the Lord. I think that's his point. I think he's trying to remind the church, hey, you do bad stuff, bad stuff happens. Yeah. And so it, from that perspective, I think that's why Peter added it in here. Um, but Mark, Mark never felt like, but do you agree? Uh, you know, does it, he says it was not part of the original story. So I think that there's just no historical, there's no way to really validate this is exactly how he died. You can't, no one was there to watch it. No one was there and reporting it. No one had a, a notepad or a scroll out and said, uh-oh, Judas is on the edge of the cliff. What's he doing with that rope? Uh-oh, the limb broke. Oh man, his guts are everywhere. You know, nobody was there to write that. And so there's no, there's no way to really know. And so I don't know that, I don't, you know, it can't be original if you don't know it. You, whoever made it up had to make it up, but does it matter if it's made up? And when I say made up, I'm not talking about them coming up with the story, but they're just looking at this hill, rocks, body, guts, and they're saying, oh, that's what happened. If somebody else looks at it and said, no, nope, this is what happened. Does it matter in the long run? Mark put it in there, if it doesn't matter then. I think, like just for that specific point, well, like I think, this is what happened? I think, that, I think that for Peter to add it, so, you know, in the upper room while they're waiting on the Holy Ghost to come out is I think what he's trying to say is, look, he's not here. And this is what happened to him. And so you got to be careful. I think that's that would be the reason he would add it. I think I think it was like a historical or not, not necessarily historical because it was present, but somewhat present. But he it was fresh on his mind. It was fresh. And he he's. He just wanted to make a point, and he wanted to give a reason why we're going to replace him. Yeah. So it's, it's I like it. Anybody? A off point, but uh, according to his gruesome death, is there different penalties for sin? Mm -hmm. Sin is sin, but is there different penalties for sin? There's one eternal penalty for it, but there's lots of consequences in life. You know, a guy goes to prison for eternity, or for not for eternity, but for life, for capital murder. He goes to prison for five years for robbery. Different, different consequences for different actions. So let, let me read one more. Let me read one more commentator, and then we'll, uh, we'll probably be done. Mikhail Parsons, he says, Peter depicts the defection of Judas and his subsequent judgment with the use of money in the third gospel as a, in a contra Matthew, he says, and he's, he's pointing out the difference. Judas does not repent and return the money, but rather according to Acts 118, purchased the field with the betrayal money. Such a self-serving purchase not only stands in sharp contrast to the way the believers sold their fields and laid the proceedings at the apostles' feet, but also in juxtapo, ju juxtaposition to the narrator of this story, Peter, who along with James and John left everything to follow Jesus. Judas has traded his inheritance in the apostolic ministry for a, for a symbol. I gotta go back and double check this quote. For a symbol, for a farm, for a farm. A symbol of his apostasy from the circle of the 12. So, Parsons, Parsons says that the reason that it's included here is because it's sent to be juxtaposed against. Here you have these other people, they've given everything. They've left everything, jobs, families, life.
They've done everything. They've given their all. And the church is getting ready to lay their possessions down for the, for the sake of the gospel. And here you have this guy that he takes his 30 pieces and he buys a field and then feels guilty. So he's saying that he literally believes that Judas himself bought the field. If that's the case, we go back to the original question. Which one's wrong? Matthew? Because Matthew's, got, Matthew's account can't be right if Judas literally bought the field. It's too different. That's my opinion. I think Parsons is a little off base. However, I do think that it's, that, that it is, I do think that it might have been in the mind of Peter to make the point, we're given everything given our whole life to this, and Judas, Judas bought a field. I was just an important friend about the field. <clears throat> I, well, I think it's in contrast to the church that's given their everything. People are dying for the gospel. You know, by, by the time this is written 38 years later, people have died. People have been crucified upside down. Apostles have been killed, you know, all for the sake of the gospel. And, and that, that the point of having it added here is that, you know, he bought a field and we gave everything. And it's a, it's, it's a object lesson. In, in my mind, his view would be wrong because there'd have to be a period of time between him buying the field, realizing what he had done. Uh, in the other point of view, uh, he took the money and betrayed him and then immediately he cast the money back to the priest. And, and so he also predicts Peter adding this in light of events that hadn't been reported yet. If Peter said this in the upper room, well, they, hadn't brought, they haven't brought their goods to the feet of the apostles yet. And so he's, he's predictive. And so my, I don't think Parsons is right. So let's come to conclusions. We got, we got eight minutes. What, let's come to conclusions. Somebody give me your conclusion of the issue. You want me to give you mine first? It's not pertinent to salvation. It's not pertinent to salvation in any way. Right. Um, I think they... They explain different parts of the same story. That's that's my opinion. It's like I was saying earlier, he uh, hung himself, the branch broke or whatever, and then he fell on the ground and his bowels gushed out, you know. And uh, through his actions, he bought the field. But he didn't literally, he didn't literally buy the field. the field. The priest bought the field, but it was his actions that bought the field where he would then be buried. And it was all because of iniquity. And uh, where it says that was the reward of iniquity. Yeah. Same thing that God said to Satan. He said, that was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created. Yeah, Isaiah. So iniquity right. was found in thee. Yeah. Same thing that Satan fell for. It was iniquity. Jesus said that iniquity in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, that it was... Um, not doing the will of the Father, if you just want to yeah. go study it. But that's, he wasn't in the will of God. You know, and God used that bad circumstance to fulfill his eternal plan, but it didn't have to be Judas. So Austin chapter number one is that the priest bought the field with the money from Judas's action. Yeah. And it's the reward of iniquity. It's the reward of iniquity. All right, so did Peter say, do you, in your opinion, did Peter actually say that, give that story in the upper room, or did he bring up the subject and Luke added the details? Do you have an opinion on that? I think Peter said it. Okay. I think he was trying to make a point. All right, so Austin, Austin chapter one. Peter told the story in the upper room. The priest bought the field with the blood money that Judas's actions purchased it. Is that it? Yeah. All right. Anybody else have a different view, alternate view, a nuance to it? Can I throw a question out there? Sure. All right. Um, 
It says in Luke 22 and 3, Then it had Satan into Judas, and then Scarlet, being numbered of the twelve. Um, so Satan here. I couldn't hear what you said. Satan here possesses Judas. In Luke 22 and 3, it says, Then entered Satan into Judas. After he went out. After the yeah. supper. Yeah. So he went out and it think, was night. Do you think that Satan had anything to do with him throw, like, do you think that he left and then he realized what he had done and he, that he had sinned and then he threw the. The question is, how do you determine the phrase entered? Was he demonically possessed or was it by temptation that he entered into his mind? Thank you. And so you're bringing up one of the fundamental questions of Christianity. Did Judas have a choice? Judas? Did Judas have a choice? Oh, yeah. Originally he did, I think. Yeah. Or originally, but after he committed that, I think it's like a possession yeah. of Satan. Satan. The question is, because, because, I mean, it was prophesied according to, according to Peter, it was talked about all the way back in, in Psalms. So was Judas on a crash course for destruction? Was he born for it? Did he have a choice? Could he have changed his mind? If so, then how would Jesus have gotten arrested and crucified? It would have been somebody else, but he did have a choice because I think it's like Hezekiah. He turned his face to the wall and he changed God's mind. They, puzzling, isn't it? Isn't it? He didn't have a choice. Because you, because, but that's one of the fundamental questions that people have with Christianity is, okay, Judas betrayed the Lord, but did he have to? How would Jesus have died otherwise? And if it would have been someone else, did they have a choice? And for every time you say someone else, I can always ask the same question, but did they have a choice? Did they have a choice? Eventually somebody was going to have to betray him to the point that he died. And that's one of the fundamental questions of Christianity. Because they chose. They chose the wrong way. What if, what if Satan tempted all of the disciples, all 12 of the disciples? Now you guys can tell I'm having fun. <laughs> but what if, he what if he tempted all 12 of the disciples, but Judas was the, the weakest one? And he made a choice. It's a good now question, but you don't. But there's no reason to. Do that, Satan entered into. That's a good. That's a, But but Jesus, when Jesus was in the upper room and he waited for for Judas to dip his bread in the right. in the liquid, and then he said, "What you do, do quickly." So yeah, that that part. He said, "What you're going to do, do quickly." And then afterwards, I believe. Is when Satan entered into it. Yeah. After he, he went out. Made a decision. After he went out. Yeah. After his he made a decision. All right, yeah. I'm going to betray the Lord. And then Satan got into it. You know what I think about Judas is Judas's life showed enough weakness that the priest knew who to go to. He had love for money. Mm -hmm. They saw him. And so the, the, on the question of on this, the question of the, the fundamental question of Judas, um, everybody has choice. And I played that out a little bit more just to, because because I don't think that we think, you know, we, we just we I, what I hope we can do is, is we make ourselves think through questions because you're going to get asked questions. You find the right person. They're going to throw every question they can against you. So why spend an hour talking about a verse that, that honestly has nothing to do with the story? I mean, really, it doesn't matter. Matthias gets picked, has nothing to do with Judas, how he died. But Peter brought it up, we talk about it. It's in the Bible, it's in Acts, we talk about it. But I think it's important to be able to look at scriptural issues and be able to, to, to find to find a reasonable explanation. So my opinion, my opinion is that um, Judas, because Matthew, because, because Matthew's account is so detailed, you know, it's, it's very detailed. He goes back, he says, I can't keep this money. I, I betrayed an innocent man. I've sinned. I don't want it. Well, it's not our problem. You did it. Don't, don't come crying to us. You made your choice. Keep your money. He throws it down at his feet. And so now the priests have this money. They got to do something with it. Well, we can't put it in the treasury. 
Treasury said we're going to go buy it. Let's go buy that field that he that you know they get they hold the money and they're trying to figure out what to do with it. In the meanwhile, he can't deal with it. He goes out. They find his body. Well, let's just buy where let's buy that field and let's just bury him there. And so that's my opinion that that it was bought for. The priests literally did the transaction, but they did it in Judas's name. That's my opinion.